Today, I'm going on a sartorial journey with the fashion designer, businesswoman, and mother of five, the wonderful Anya Hindmarch. Anya founded her eponymous company as a teenager in 1987 and has since grown it into an award-winning global brand known for its craftsmanship, creativity, and sense of humor. She launched the hugely successful I'm Not a Plastic Bag campaign in 2007, which saw thousands of people queuing to purchase the tote from Sainsbury's. A staggering 80,000 were sold on launch day. The bag garnered huge press coverage globally, igniting the debate around the use of plastic bags and contributed to the eventual decision to charge for plastic bags in the UK. This then brilliantly evolved into the I Am A Plastic Bag, which is made out of recycled plastic. An advocate of British design and arts, Anya is a non-executive director of the British Fashion Council and emeritus trustee of the Royal Academy of Arts and the Design Museum. She was appointed governor of the University of the Arts in 2010 and a prime minister's business ambassador in 2011. She holds both an MBE and a CBE and is the trustee of the Royal Marsden Ch Cancer Charity. She has honorary doctorates from UEA and the University of Essex. Her creativity and marketing savvy know no bounds, and I'm honoured that she's made the time to join me for this conversation. So hello and welcome, <laughs> Anya, and please forgive the sounds of helicopters in the background because it's a it's a hazard of living where I do. <laughs> How are you? We're really well, and it's lovely. Thank you so much for having me this morning. And um, you have to, uh, I have to apologise to my parents because we've been tackling um, a fire, and not luckily not in our stores, but in um, the uh, the restaurant very close to our stores. We've been up with 80 firefighters. So forgive my lack of um, hair and makeup today for this. <laughs> well, lovely, you look lovely... amazing. You really do. And and I must admit, I, I'm just in, sort of in awe of the fact that you are still here. And writing your introduction, I felt myself wondering how how long to make it, because you've so many achievements under your belt. And yet knowing you as I do, I'm aware that there'll be a ton of new projects in the pipeline. Can you share which, which ones you're most excited about or one that you're most excited about? Uh, well, I'm always excited about the next thing I'm working on. It's funny, that's always my, my favourite project is the one that you're sort of, you know, next about to launch. Um, and um, we've got a number of things bubbling up at the moment. Um, but I think the thread, obviously I couldn't tell you about those yet, but I think the uh, the thread always is um, kind of using the platform of, of fashion um, for sort of, you know, to, to give it a bit of a purpose, because I mean, I'm sure we'll talk a lot about fashion in, in our time together, but it, it's a funny thing, fashion. In some ways, it feels so superfluous and so outdated, actually, in many respects. I mean, I'm quite sure we all have a, enough clothes in our wardrobe to mean that we actually don't need to buy another thing for the rest of our lives, in truth. So how can we make fashion relevant? How can we make it make sense? Um, and so all the projects have a bit of a thread um, uh, around that. That's as much as I can say at the moment, but um, that's what I'm working on. Well, you've just answered my second question. So that's that sounds so excited. And I, I must admit, I couldn't agree with you more. I think fashion does feel out, outdated, which is such an irony, isn't it? I mean, you know, it should be the leader and yet it, it does feel outdated. And I'm really glad that you're working on a on a reset program. Let's put it that way. Um, but today we're going on a style journey together. Um, so perhaps let's start with possibly unfairly because you've been with 80 firefighters this morning. But how did you decide what you were going to get out of bed and put on this morning? Well, it was a bit of a rush this morning. <laughs> um, but but um, actually, Fridays are my remote working day, which is funny. It really makes you think differently about how you um, sort of spend your time and how you how you in a really nice way actually um so obviously work is sort of more sort of you know people facing and um and and I'm, I'm a great believer in you know dress apart get the job and 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 sort of you know we, we convey so much of who we are and the roles that we play through how we dress and I think that's actually the, the point and the only actually almost the main bit of fashion that interests me because it, it's um it really is it's sort of like they always talk about the the actor never getting into the the, the role of the character until they wear the shoes of the role um and I I, I really believe that actually that um, you know we do especially women you know where one minute we might need to be in a board meeting or the next minute we will be you know on the touchline of a school um, a school so it's a child leaving right now 
on my days going. <laughs> it's trying to be so quiet that it's actually more noise. Less. <laughs> um, but there so, we go. Know, <laughs> one minute we're um, we're you know at a board meeting. Next minute we're we're sort of doing some child related project or you know we might be in a warehouse visiting our warehouse facilities or we might be at a you know a, a fashion interview so we have all these different roles and to a certain extent I do think you need to it is a mark of respect to dress in an appropriate way and it's also I think a a mark of um or it gives an element of 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 um hopefully instilling confidence to to you know to behave in the right way so um I find it very interesting there's a million different um uh subtle signs aren't there with fashion you know whether I know I'm not answering your question, um, but whether um, whether, you know, you have a sort of slight hint towards sort of something that's kind of current right now or as kind of absolutely I do not care at all. I'm over and above above fashion and, and very confident. So all those things really tie into, into how we dress and why we dress. And um, in answer to your question, very long winded answer <laughs> might be a bit of a. Um, thread through this interview today with the madness that's happened this morning. Uh, what what did I decide to wear? So I decided to wear something comfortable that was going to get me out of bed very very quickly. Um, and um, I'm wearing some Nilly Low Tan uh, camouflage trousers and a sort of trusty grey jacket, which seems to kind of make that okay on a Friday. And, and some Birkenstocks. So there you go. That's my my Friday emergency get out of bed look. Maybe the camo trousers are a slight nod towards the firefighters. What do you think? I I think that's very respectful. <laughs> <laughs> But would you say you were exposed to fashion from a young age? Yes, actually. I think my mother dresses and she really cares about how she looks. And she um, she is very elegant and um, and she's always loved fashion, not in a sort of, you know, slavish way. But um, I remember one of my earliest memories is she had these very beautiful um, belts, which were very sort of skinny, really, really fine belts. And one of them was divided. It's a very visual and sort of vivid memory uh, for me, which was the belt was divided half gold and half silver. The tiny little buckle, um, and I remember these on rather sort of seventies flared camel trousers, and I remember all her handbags, obviously. So, so yes, I think it was something that um, registered early. So, absolutely, I was I was surrounded and influenced by how she put a lot of effort into how she looks, and she still does. She looks amazing, um, and she quite a lot to live up to, honestly. Um, but um, also, I, I registered it. So, it obviously sort of it was one of those things that sort of appealed to me, I suppose, from a young age. Do you remember when, at what point, your mother actually allowed to, you to start making your own style choices? <laughs> well, I, I remember when she didn't, put it that way. Um, <laughs> I remember wanting these um, red tap dancing shoes, which I thought were just, you know, when I was about six, um, which seemed very, very appealing to me, and they, those weren't allowed. Um, and I remember an awful lot of high-heeled conversations quite early on, which weren't allowed. I remember some quite punky outfits, which were definitely not allowed. So it was more about what I wasn't allowed. So I guess I had a sort of, I was fairly headstrong, and she probably rightly was trying to, um, you know, rein me in. Um, so, so yes, those are my early memories. I, I remember having white platform boots, God help me, on my Christmas list. That was clearly ignored. <laughs> <laughs> but what would you say was your earliest sartorial mem memory when you first put something on that made you feel completely different, really special? Um, yeah, I do. There, there was a stage when I remember going shopping with my mother, taking the train to London and going up, and we, we sort of went shopping and bought um, some clothes. And I remember... I suppose I remember how special I felt about having that day to go shopping. So it was interesting. It was, there was a sort of a sense of um, getting some one-on-one -on -one time and some attention and not that I was lacking it, but it was a sort of special day. Um, and, um, and I remember coming back, there were some shoes from Russell and Bromley that I remember there were sort of brown, so I'm rather disgusting now, but they felt quite cool at the time. Um, and um, and various other things. And I remember, as you say, how it made me feel. And I think that's the thing about fashion. It, it's um, It's quite mood altering and it's quite confidence boosting uh, and I think that's that's the joy of, of fashion really so I remember I don't know what age I was maybe I don't know maybe nine or eleven or something but I remember that quite clearly and I'm always fascinated by the sibling dynamic and you have a sister was there ever any competitive dressing that went on or did you both very much have your own style no, there was definitely competitive dressing and there was also competitive stealing of each other's clothes I seem to remember probably um, <laughs> Um, so, um, so and yes, it's quite hard if someone sort of, you know, buys the trousers like that, then that's, you know, it's like peas in a pod, I always think family positions, you know, that, that, that pea in, 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 in that pod is that positions taken. So therefore you have to sort of go elsewhere, um, and sort of form your own sort of identity. And, um, so yeah, so that was, that was also a memory, but, but actually mostly, mostly quite, um, quite good humoured, <laughs> thankfully. 
<laughs> Thankfully. Did, did you wear a school uniform? We did. Um, I went to quite a strict all-girls convent um, and we had a sort of maroon, um, so not quite burgundy, not quite red, um, kilt, um, long white socks. Um, we had an Airtex shirt and a maroon jumper. It wasn't probably the most fetching of outfits and I still have a bit of an issue with that colour, interestingly. It's funny how it's, um, it, it sort of, you know, ruins it for life. Um, and, uh, and regulation underwear, imagine that, um, and not a very sort of attractive sort of sports kit. So it was it was pretty prescribed. And even the shoes were regulation. They were like brown nurse's shoes, which was quite traumatizing, I'll be honest, because, um, you know, if you care about that sort of thing, that's sort of, so I always tended to break the rules and wear a sort of jumper underneath that so it just had a flash of another jumper. And I absolutely break the rules, rules on the shoes. shoes. The shoes were a step too far as far as I was concerned. Um, and I was also a day girl at a board school so I felt that was you know in a way it was you could perhaps slightly bend the rules so yeah it was it was um, it was an interesting school uniform put it that way. Um, when do you feel you really acquired your fashion mojo? I think probably that sort of 13 onwards you know when you start maybe 11 almost I'm very bad at timings but when you sort of start to be able to go shopping yourself as in unaccompanied um, and when you start to get some pocket money or get a sort of you know a job that gives you some disposable weekend shopping money um so around that stage probably and um and you know i remember going and finding you know as you all did your sort of traips for the sort of the, the shops of, of the of the day and you know find your look and i i think you know you're you're then experimenting and you sort of find that thing it's very interesting isn't it how you settle on something that becomes your character which i think often settles and sticks for for quite a long time and i, I never quite know whether that's um you know, what is sort of slightly formed as a child and sort of actually sort of um, almost, you know, given to you or, or and then you sort of evolve it or whether actually it, it can change dramatically. I think there is a thread um, through the way I dress as a sort of, a, a, I suppose, a kind of constant um, that has evolved through all the different influences. But there's still a sort of constant, which I think is ultimately your character, isn't it? I mean, I'm not a ta-da, look at me in a big red carpet dress. That would be my worst. I'd much rather be in a a man's tuxedo um, and have a beautiful handbag or um, and sort of I'm, I'm not good at being um, I don't like necessarily to be noticed I'd much rather sort of be in the background and people notice me quietly um, so I, I suppose I, I my the way I would dress would I suppose amplify that uh, or hopefully not amplify that in a way but it would it would signal that um, so I think I'm sort of quite a discreet dresser. Hopefully I'm a sort of a grower. You know, you sort of might not notice me and then you notice me and quite like me when you do. <laughs> I don't know. Um, God, you're so modest. I'm with my clothes. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, but I, I'm, actually, I'm actually... <laughs> but actually, <laughs> um, on that subject, how would, you, how would you sum up your style in three words? Or how would you like someone else to sum up your style in three words? Your style DNA. Um, Grey, navy and white. <laughs> I haven't had that answer before, but I like it. <laughs> but basically, not only in terms of colours, but also in terms of style. I mean, so I'm quite. So if I look at my wardrobe, and I mean, of course, I have some lovely, kind of fun, bright things. But actually, I love buying clothes that you don't notice too much. That also, therefore, gives them longevity because the moment you buy something that's very much of a moment, um, it can date very quickly. And I like to invest in good pieces. So therefore, if you invest in a really beautiful handmade jacket, for example, in grey, navy, or maybe white, you know that's something that will forever be good. Um, so I'm sort of quite, <laughs> quite sober <laughs> in my in my choices, but I but I invest and then they last and then I look after them as well. Yeah. I mean, you've been in the fashion world for many, many years. Um, have you ever felt that being stylish has been a burden or have you always just loved putting looks together? I think a bit of both. I think it gives you a lovely palette and a lovely... I mean, I, I absolutely know that if you walk into a meeting and you feel great, um, you know, you, you feel you get noticed. You feel you, you know, you... But not only do you... I think there's an advantage to to... Um, looking nice for sure and that that's that's that can be interpreted in a million different ways but I think the biggest advantage is the fact that you feel good and you then look people in the eye you stand that bit straighter you you I, I love wearing things that I feel so nice in that actually I then forget what I'm wearing um, and I'm then just me and I think that's the point of clothes for me I don't necessarily want to be sort of noticed I just want to not think about it but feel confident enough to sort of you know, to, 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 to be the best version of myself. So, um, but yes, it can be a burden in all fairness, because I think there's a lot of pressure on us girls to, and increasingly interestingly on men as well, actually, but to, um, 
you know, I've got mm. three family weddings coming up this year and there's the night before and there's the day and then there's the, you know, pre-lunch and then there's the dinner. You know, and actually men are thinking one suit, black tie, bump done. And we're going, OK, you need something there and something there and something there. And you can't wear the same things to all the weddings because maybe that doesn't feel respectful to the different children and, and on and on. So it's, you know, it's a big investment. Uh, it's a lot of planning. Um, and and there are, you know, that point about not wearing the same thing to the same nephew or niece's wedding uh, there's a sort of respect thing about making an effort as well so I think the the pressure is hugely on I think women should be paid more <laughs> for the fact that they have to um, cut their hair and <laughs> buy more clothes have their nails done you know I mean I don't know if we're idiots or whether we should actually frankly be paid more than men but we're definitely not um, so it you know it is it is and sometimes it is a bit of a burden um, I mean obviously you're a very famous bag designer how do you feel about designer it bags and quite frankly the huge price tags connected to them well I don't so on it bags which I mean luckily much less of a thing now for me there's nothing worse than having much nothing less cool than having the same thing as everyone else I mean kind of what's the point of that really it sort of feels a bit unimaginative and and often with it bags um I think it comes from a place of insecurity which is look at me I've got the this bag which costs this much and that's why there's been this huge growth of um, these um, very well-recognized bags, particularly in the emerging sort of economies uh, where wealth has perhaps been newer. And I think in more sophisticated places, so older economies such as the UK, people are more confident to not just have to have the same thing that everyone recognizes so they can actually show what they care about. And I think that's much more interesting personally. So um, for me, it's an interesting reason as to why people all have the same bag. Um, do I think they're too expensive, which is sort of sort of your question? Um, actually not, actually often. Mm. It's, it's very interesting as someone who knows intimately um, the cost of the raw materials, good raw materials, well-sourced raw materials, which is the, the next thing. So, you know, we can talk, I'm sure, about um, environmental issues around fashion. But um, actually making things in a way that is yeah. responsible to the planet is, is currently much more expensive. It actually should get less and less um, uh, expensive or there should be less of a difference as we do um, things in that way more regularly. Um, but also, I think um, there's, you know, actually craftsmanship costs. And I think there's been a massive... Um, offshoring over the last sort of 20 or 30 years of everything being made all over the world where you sort of chase cheaper labor as I think we all look at our carbon footprint and is it right that we're moving leather to this country and then the stitching to that country and trying to minimize the cost but at huge cost to the planet of moving things around more and if we onshore more which I think is a super interesting topic for the next 20 years um I'm afraid there will in the short term be uh, higher costs of labour, um, but less cost of carbon. So there's so much to think about um, as we navigate this next stage. Uh, you know, the background to my entire career has been to that word globalisation, and that's selling globally, sup global supply chain, sourcing globally. Um, and I think it's going to be about localization going forward. And I think that's a really interesting um, thing to think about because it has so many consequences um, you know, at, at every level, actually. Um, and I, I find that super exciting. But can I just ask you, the, there have been some mega brands recently who we don't need to talk about which ones in particular, who have have sort of hiked their prices 30%, 50%, almost because it's, it's a marketing ploy, quite frankly. You know, um, raw materials, as you know, and I, I know, have gone up, but they haven't gone up 30 50 Eighty percent, and and I just wondered how you felt about that. Well, I mean, it's interesting. So we've in fact we've just priced a new collection, and um, and our prices on average have gone about twenty percent. So that that's what we're seeing, and that's probably yeah. I would say in my market about about right. Uh, and interesting, the way we've approached that because it's a very specific moment. Thank you, Putin, um, for all the cost of energy, which is one of the sort of main drivers. Of across this 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 pricing landscape because it's affected freight and energy and and, and which affects everything um so um as a consequence of that what we did is we we hope this won't be a permanent price hike and we're very sensitive i i don't like charging too much for things i think it feels wrong personally um i think it mm. should be the right price for the for the craftsmanship and, and the work and the raw materials so what we did is we actually looked at our all of our costs and we actually um asked our uh partners uh, and manufacturing partners to work with us to absorb a bit of the increase we've absorbed a lot of the increase and we put up our prices a little bit so we've sort of done a third a third a third so therefore we've managed to mostly maintain a lot of our prices and just on some where we were already just unable there was on the edge anyway we've had to nudge some up um there is and it is interesting that bit about 
is it a marketing ploy to have high prices? So if you're into that, as we discussed earlier, if you, if, if the, the reason for you buying a handbag is to show that you're wealthy, which is the status point I made earlier, for, for that sort of less secure um, customer, um, then I think that, um, you know, that can work to their benefit. And you know what? Great. I mean, all they're doing is making profit um, and employing more people, and that all goes back into the economy. So I'm not, I'm not dissing anyone who wants to make a profitable, healthy company. That's actually sort of pays for our hospitals and our roads. So that's fine. Um, but there is a point where um, it just kind of, it just gets a bit crazy for the customer. So I mean, I think everyone has to make the right choices for their own business, and I, I don't judge anyone on that. We all have to do that. Um, for me, I, I felt that I didn't want to probably push that uh, price increase onto my customer fully um, and just to sort of see where we get to and also to see what happens next because hopefully some, I mean, already the, the, the cost of um, energy is coming down and, you know, we're finding ways around these issues. So, it, listen, it's, it's a thorny moment, truthfully, um, and everyone is having to find the right route for their business. And I think, you know, that's um, ultimately if their customers won't buy it, well, ultimately if their customers do buy it at those higher prices, well, they're not themselves out really great. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Really, really respectful and insightful answer, actually. Do you ever get inspiration from vintage bags? Yes, I mean, I get inspiration from everything, honestly. Um, and I, um, in some ways, I try not to look too specifically because it can it can sort of throw you sometimes about, you know, will I ever do anything as nice or will I end up being subconsciously influenced? And so I sort of, I kind of look in a, with a sort of what I call a lazy brain, you know, where I'm not sort of focusing too much. Um, and I'm a great believer in feeding your brain and just putting in loads and loads of, references and, and for me that's also going to exhibitions and learning about the history of of product development and you know engineering and all those things that actually sort of feature into product design um and um and then it sort of all kind of goes in and it sort of spits out ideas i don't know quite how it works it's a sort of weird engine inside my head but I'm sure it's the same for you <laughs> it's a, well, yeah it's a lovely sponge isn't it just drawing in all that visual information and practical information too how am i using it how am i wearing it um so yes i'm i'm on the same page now you famously wrote a book if in doubt, wash your hair. Um, and I always think of you as your long, glossy locks as very much being your signature. And I just wondered, um, did the importance of your own hair inspire the book or the book's title in any way? <laughs> um, I don't know. I think it was more that I was actually asked to do um, an article where it's like your top 10 tips for whatever, I can't remember what it was now. And... Um, uh, and and I think they said, you know, what 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 is one of the, so I kind of went through my top tips, and one of them was, you know, what if in doubt wash your hair. And I think that came from the fact that I just know if I'm feeling the best version of myself, um, I will be the best version of myself. So there's nothing worse than sitting in a meeting thinking, oh, I just wish I had worn this jacket, it's feeling a bit uncomfortable, or I just wish I had brushed my hair this morning or washed my hair this morning. Or so it really is that thing of of. Be the best version of yourself for the best chances, which ties into how you look and um, equally and, and all sorts of aspects. But, you know, sartorially, that makes a difference. But um, also, I think there's an element of washing your, uh, someone's talked about washing your troubles down the plug hole. I think there is a, there's something quite cathartic about actually starting again. It's, it's a new start, isn't it, to a certain extent? Um, so I think um, so I think that I remember that title and, and and it just stuck and a friend of mine is a is is actually now my book agent and she she said would you write a book and I went no I've got nothing to write about and I remember suddenly sitting down and thinking actually I've actually got quite a lot to say more than I had <laughs> realised and that title just pinged into my brain for some reason and and so much more the older we get you know the the knowledge we can share and impart well I think I think probably I just turned fifty at that point and I I um I realised that. Uh, and and this, if in doubt or sure her has the word doubt in it and I think doubt's a very interesting subject for women actually because I think we often think about it as, as, a, as a bad thing um, and I would argue having reached this large old age that actually doubt is a wonderful friend that sort of sits on your shoulder and it keeps you safe it's there kind of going don't mess up don't mess up it's to sort of keep you safe but but actually, as you get older, you realize you don't mess up. You know, you've done enough now to know that you will find a way through it. So I, I see it now as my friend. So the book is very much talking about, you know, that sense of doubt that we have. Um, and I really learned through various things that I've sort of been through that that actually we need to really embrace it. And we know more than we think. So I wanted to write a book that was kind of very much girlfriend to girlfriend or mother to daughter, just to kind of basically share everything I wish I'd known earlier, really very honestly and I hope kindly. And do you have those conversations with your daughter? 
Absolutely. And, and in fact, every time I wrote a chapter, she would she would read it. And and it was lovely having her feedback and, and her input um, and 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 also with girlfriends, because I think, you know, so often people talk about successes of careers or, um, you know, all the things. I mean, you read that lovely list of things I've done and it just sounds quite cool. Right. But on the inside, I'm always like, have I done that well enough? And, you know, could I do more? And should I have done that? And, you know, that's how we all feel. Everyone feels that, whether they're the prime minister or the you know, the president of the United States. So I think it's only right that we say that is normal um, so that when people feel that way, they, they, they don't feel that it's, it's, uh, it's just them. So I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's right that we do that and pass that down to people younger than us. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, do you think you've got a style icon? Not one person, no. But I think what I love is people who, I was going to say don't care, that's not right at all, but who are themselves with lovely confidence. For me, we, so often in life, I think people strive for, um, for for sort of for wealth, which often doesn't make people very happy. Interestingly, it makes you safe, but it often doesn't make you very happy. And I think people also strive to to be cool. And I think there's nothing less cool than trying to be cool. Um, and I think what is cool is actually being happy in your own skin. So I I, I think my style icons would be those people who wear what they love to wear and they are really happy with it they feel great they are you know they're that person who doesn't care they just are themselves so confidence is so anyone confident would be my star icon um almost sort of irrespect or irrespective of how they look actually um i think own your look and um and and i think that's just unbelievably cool so i can't think of a single person but there's lots of people that come into that camp for me yeah, there's a word that I always used in the design studio, and that was effortless. Everything had to look effortless, because I think if you can feel effortless when you put something on, you're you're going to be able to focus on your day, aren't you? That makes me think about your, I've had so many of them, those cashmere jumpers with the roll-up satin sleeves, remember? <laughs> I remember well, them well was... and still have a load. <laughs> but you're one of the first people to do that sort of comfy luxury and actually I think it's it's such a dream isn't it as a girl not to have to wear a really you know tightly fitting dress and have to hold your tummy in all day and uncomfortable shoes and and I think that actually that idea that you can feel cool and effortless and chic and uh, and look polished but actually also be comfortable is is complete win so cheers for that <laughs> I, I are you very conscious of the word comfort when choosing what you what you buy more and more, because I think that there's nothing more luxurious than being comfortable. Um, so, you know, it, it's, you know, it's, it's why isn't it brilliant that a Birkenstock's become cool, for example, because, you know, it's, 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 it's so lovely that, and I think when you're comfortable, and I, I always think those, you know, so many girlfriends who sit there looking immaculate and some amazing dress, but I can just see they're uncomfortable. I can't wait to take off those shoes. They can't wait to sort of unbutton that, that, that jacket. And, and actually I, I sort of think in a way, also, this is a journey for women, isn't it? You know, we've come from corsets, right, all the way through. Um, and uh, and so there is this point where it's OK for us to be comfortable. I mean, that should be sort of a given, right? I mean, you know, it's ridiculous, actually. I mean, high heels are fascinating to me um, because, you know, if you look at the history of high heels, it was often to obviously to elongate the leg, but also to actually rather horribly, to make women look a bit vulnerable, to make men feel protective and therefore um, sort of to, to to appeal, therefore, to men, which is it's sort of sad, actually, when you think yeah. about that. And, and and whilst I don't think anyone exploited it, and actually I think women are more confident now and actually I think they don't need to feel that they're tottering to kind of feel a man might put their arm around them. I think hopefully um, they can they can get their men for different reasons. You know what I mean? So it's interesting, this journey. Totally. And actually, heels have, have now become a thing of choice when you want to stride out, lengthen your legs and sort of walk perhaps in a little bit of a sassier way. But there's no necessity to wear them, which is, you know, just such a such a delight, isn't it? You know, we can all be as powerful in our sneakers and in our Birkenstocks. Totally. No, I think it's a really big moment, actually. And I think because actually it's not very empowering for women to have to dress in an uncomfortable way to be successful or to be considered attractive. And so that's a really big moment. And I think, you know, we're we're actually bashing down these these hurdles at a hell of a pace right now. Um, and I think confident women breed confident women. Um, and I think therefore it's so important to to talk about these things and to share with women and kind of go, this is how I feel. I, I'm, I've just done a fascinating project. Um, 
with the Women's Institute, um, which is the largest female organization in the UK. Okay, and we think about it sure as you know, our grannies and you know, German Jerusalem, but actually it's the most amazing original social network um, where people meet for craft, which when you think about in times of mindfulness and actually doing things other than screens, and where there is actually an amazing campaigning ability of sort of soft protest that, you know, they were the first people to campaign against litter and against plastic pollution and uh, educating women. And, and in fact, they were the the, the women who, um, you know, pretty much fed the UK on the home front. I mean, it's a phenomenal organisation. And so what was interesting, listening to the history, I went to a lecture about the history of the Women's Institute and, and learning how women, pre they had the vote, and how this Women's Institute, it was these women gathering of all different stages in education and, and strata of society, gathering together, which gave women the confidence to then say, we want the vote and we're going to behave a certain way and we're actually going to take control. So it's very empowering. You have such an unbelievably busy life, um, not only with your business, you've got five children and it strikes me that you've probably barely got enough time to sleep let alone shop do you ever use a stylist I don't shop actually it's really interesting and I'm sort of kind of slightly proud and slightly ashamed to admit that I decided that I think that the way I dress and the effort of shopping is something that's important for my job um, and I don't have the bandwidth because I don't want to do that at weekends because I don't have the time and I have a very busy home life as you said um, and during the week I am in meetings from eight until eight and then often doing either family commitments or or work commitments so it's it's a very busy job and I just realized I have to be honest about the fact it's a piece of work I need to farm out and actually I find having someone who helps me uh, with this means that I actually probably spend less money because it's it's a piece of work which you know do I need to refresh that jacket yes it's looking tired uh, as someone who's 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 sort of got that project is a huge help to me so um, I decided that a, a few years ago and it's been a huge help actually and I think it's a really big um trend actually in women recognizing this is something they need to do um and um and that it actually is is incredibly helpful um so it's a bit a, a different way of shopping but i think becoming quite a new way of, of of shopping for women and managing their wardrobes it saves money um you know net net even by obviously i i pay someone per the hour to, to do that but it for me it's 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 part of my job and i am pretty efficient and and then uh, I will sort of say I've got all these things coming up. Obviously, I need work lists and so on. But I've got you know these events, this work trip, this you know Tokyo, Hong Kong. Did I've got five events? This one has to be photographed. This one, you know, it's it's a huge. When you do the spreadsheet, it's big. Um, and then we literally sort of map those events. And actually, those events then see me through sort of various business meetings. I then have quite a, a good system where um, I photograph. I, if I buy an outfit, I've got it. I put it there. Handbag, shoes. Did I photograph it and have an album on my phone of clothes and outfits. So therefore, if I'm planning to go on a work trip. Um, with, I don't know, what, whatever it might be, I can just flick through that album and kind of go, that'll do night one, that'll do night two. So it's really systematic. And I think sometimes we don't look at the fact that if you look at what we have to do as women, and I take these three weddings I've got coming up, you know, I've, I've got the outfits, but the shirt was the wrong size. I need to reorder that. That's on waiting list. And I need to have that altered. That's too long on the sleeve. That needs some sort of slip to go on. You know, it's all this sort of stuff. It's a lot. That shoe's too high for that. And I've got to walk a long way. So in fact, that won't work. Do I take a pair of shoes? to change into in fact can I find a medium heel that will do both and oh my goodness that's gravel that thing blah, blah, blah. it's a lot so actually we need to face up to the fact that it's a piece of work and um and it's okay to to treat it as such honestly um and there's nothing worse than going to all those events and just not feeling you your best version of yourself so clearly that's um it sounds privileged and to a certain extent it is and I recognize that but actually net net and given that it is my job very specifically um to to um working in fashion and doing a lot of those sorts of things um I um I do think it actually saves me money because I think I was definitely um buying things I wasn't wearing or wasn't getting altered um so often you have you know a whole outfit but it's just missing the thing that means you can wear it and if you realize actually it's that that unlocks that jigsaw puzzle you can save yourself money rather than buying a new outfit and so on and so on so but before I actually had the person who helped us in my clothes um I used my sister and I just want to sort of say to, to people listening in who kind of go, well, that's easy for her. She's a sort of, you know, fashion person and, and, and has to do it. But actually sometimes finding a friend who you trust, you do it for them and they do it for you is also another way of looking at that. Do you have any fashion moments that you, you look at and think, oh, what was I thinking? Why did I put that on? Well, I think everyone does. And I think it's always actually when you when you wear something that you don't, I mean, you kind of know that feeling when you're wearing something, you don't feel quite yourself and you think I'll go for it. And actually, I think it's worth listening to your inner voice. You need to feel yourself. I think that's the most important thing. Um, and I think whenever you don't, then it can go wrong, really. 
Yeah, too, too true. So I always ask the question about what is your approach to sustainable fashion? And I think you've, you've covered off a lot of that. But, but anything else on, on the subject of sustainability? Because it's, it's such an important one. It's so much part of our lives and our vernacular right now. Um, and and you're such an informed and wise person. Well, two things. On this journey, I'm, I'm no expert at all, but I've done a huge amount of, of work in this area because it's, it's it sort of fell in my lap with the original project, I'm Not a Plastic Bag, as you spoke of earlier. Um, and then it's sort of become almost my life's work in a strange way, but I'm, I'm still learning every day. And by the way, even the experts I speak to don't seem to be experts. So it's it's I think that the, the sort of the North Star for me is common sense in a way, as, I, as the way I think about it. But the... The bottom line is we need less and we need it better sourced. Um, what um, we need to think about, I think, is that, um, you know, and I'll, you know, I'll talk in my own field, which is leather. So just going to give a few tips on that because I think that's probably quite important. Be very careful to not do the trendy thing. So vegan leather is just, it's what we used to call, um, uh, oh my goodness, what was the name for it? Um, plastic. Uh, leatherette. <laughs> Well, it's plastic, exactly. It is plastic. So just be very, very aware that when you're buying vegan leather, you're buying plastic. Um, so um, that is not sustainable. And, and mostly it's single-use plastic. And um, plant-based leathers, I don't know why they call them leathers because they're not, um, are often, so mushroom or apple or pineapple, really interesting. And definitely we should all be exploring other ways of, of making things. But mostly they're mixed and held together with plastic. Recycled leather, mostly also held together with a soup of plastic because that's, that's the binder. Um, and so therefore, it's very easy to kind of jump on the trendy bandwagon. The truth is, and having done a huge amount of um, experience uh, uh, work in this field, um, at the moment, actually, the most sustainable thing of all is actually not wasting the skins from the animal that are being eaten while they're still being eaten. If we're eating animals, that don't let those go to waste, and mostly they are. Um, and to if they are tanned well, I come back to that, and locally, come back to that too, um, and they're traceable, so you know where they're coming from. You know they're coming from a good farm. Um, so animals and cows in particular do a really good thing for soil health, which obviously is important for sequestration of, of carbon uh, into the soil. So all the arguments against cows can pretty much be disproved if they come from a regenerative good farm. So not when it's, you know, it's basically becoming a sort of desert where it's over industrially farmed, where the soil is slammed so hard it can't, you know, actually absorb any carbon, but where um, animals and cows in particular are involved in a beautiful natural farm, uh, a biodynamic farm in particular, and where they, they have a really important purpose to actually turn the soil and to do really important things. So, you know, really learn your facts. I'm afraid there's so much nonsense. Um, and so, and I long traffic light system where you have you know you know if you're buying something that's bad or good um but please don't diss leather and this is not i can work in anything this is not me sort of because i come from another background it's because i actually tried to work in recycled leather i tried to work in alternatives and i realized they're much much worse the other thing to add uh, and is that um and we, we work in a way where we can actually trace the skin back to the farm so we can trace it back to the number on the ear on the animal so not on all our products but quite a lot of them particularly in a range called return to nature which is a project we did which actually is about how could i make a product that actually would never end up in landfill so we've done all these projects on using plastic and keeping it from landfill i'm a plastic bag um, i'm not a plastic bag but then someone said to me of course there is no waste in nature. And it's true, an apple, when it falls from the tree, doesn't end up in landfill. It biodegrades, it dissolves, flies eat it, becomes food. It then composts into the soil and makes the soil uh, more healthy and nutritious. So could I make a bag that did that? So, so we worked for two years on a project where the bag does and is aud audited externally and it does biodegrade, it does compost when you when you actively compost it. And that means that also leather is often coated in, in a thin layer of plastic. So most trainers are just leather coated in plastic, which is why when it rains, you don't need to worry about it. That's why we don't polish our shoes anymore. Um, and so we've actually changed the plastic and actually used a liquid silk as an alternative. Um, so anyway, I could so much to say, but all I'm just saying is don't jump on the trendy bandwagon. Honestly, it's really dangerous. Um, and so do your research is probably my main message. Well, let's just swing on to some quick fire questions um, to end on. Um, what fashion advice would you give to your 20 year old self? Stop caring. It doesn't matter that much. Your views on tattoos. OK, um, I think temporary if it's a one word answer. Beauty treatment you couldn't give up. A good moisturiser. High end or high street? Uh, high end, mostly. Minimalism or maximalism? Probably more minimalism. For me 
Crocs, cute or puke? Puke. Bodycon or boho? Boho. Red carpet or relax? Relax. Shapewear or sexy lingerie? Can I say neither? <laughs> <laughs> Tights or stockings? Tights. Bikini or one piece? Bikini. And finally, Anya, one last question at the end of the day. What do you or don't you wear in bed? I wear an Anderson and Shepherd man's nightshirt. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Anya, I could have talked all day with you. Thank you. After your 80 firemen in the village this morning, I'm in awe of you being here and showing up. And I cannot thank you enough for your witty and informed and informative answers. Thank you. Thank you so much. And lots of love. 